I'm Mohamed Saraj, Director of Non-Invasive Cardiology and Professor of Medicine at NYU Langone Health. This lecture is about contrast echocardiography. These are my disclosures. The American Society of Echocardiography has a guidelines for cardiac sonographers uh, for the performance of contrast echocardiography from 2014. And there is an update from 2018 um, and this time, instead of a contrast agent, the term ultrasonic enhancing agents was used. And part of the contrast echocardiography topic is also dealt uh, in the guidelines for the use of echocardiography in the evaluation of cardiac sources of emboli from 2016. What's the physiologic basis for echocontrast agent use? The primary determinant is the size of the capillaries um, and we can judge the size of the capillaries by the size of the red blood cells. So red blood cells is roughly seven and a half micrometers um, in diameter and red blood cells barely squeeze through the capillaries. And anything that is larger than the red blood cells will be trapped in the capillaries in case of intravenous injection. Uh, everything larger than the red blood cells will be trapped in the lungs and will never pass into systemic circulation. This is an illustration that shows how the red blood cells squeeze through the capillaries. And then when exit the capillaries, assume their original shape. So now let's look at the older echo contrast or ultrasound enhancing agents relative to the size of red blood cells. So red blood cells, seven and a half micrometers. And we'll compare these uh, contrast agents or ultrasound enhancing agents by the average particle size, by the shell or the gas that they contain. Agitated saline is, uh, uh, does not have intrinsic shells. It contains air and the bubbles of agitated saline on average tends to be larger than the pulmonary capillaries. So therefore, when uh, injected intravenously, they will all be trapped inside the lungs unless there is an intracardiac or intrapulmonary shunt. In contrast, uh, microbubble ultrasound enhancing agents have a particle size that it's uh, on average less than that of red blood cells. And these agents include lumison, uh, with the two micrometer average size, Definity with the 2.2 micrometers, and Opticon on average 3.3 micrometers. Um, Lumison and Definity have a lipid shell, um, and Definity and Opticon share a flutran um, gas. Opticon shell is made of albumin, and Lumison's gas is uh, SF6. What happens to contrast agent after intravenous injection? If you do agitated saline bubbles, they can appear in the left heart in systemic circulation only if there is a right to left shunt, um, and therefore they're used to detect intracardiac or intrapulmonary shunt. In contrast, microbubble contrast agents or ultrasound enhancing agents will routinely appear in the left heart and systemic circulation and therefore they are used for left heart opacification. Let's show an agitated saline used for detective patent for amino valley. It's a case presentation of 52 year old previously healthy woman. She presents with an acute onset aphasia in the morning while she was eating breakfast. The husband realized that the patient was talking but was not making any sense. So she quickly was brought uh, to the emergency department. She had a head CT which showed no bleed uh, and she received a thrombolytic uh, agent. So this is her perfusion head CT that shows a large a partial a parietal, parietal stroke which is possibly embolic in nature. And this is her bubble study, intravenous injection of agitated saline with the early appearance of a large amount of bubbles in the left heart uh, consistent with the intracardiac shunt, or more specifically, patent foramen ovale. It's apical four-chamber view, 
um, early bubble appearance in the left heart indicative of patent foramen ovale. This is a frozen image, and often you will see it the negative contrast in the right heart because the injection is done through the arm, therefore bubbles come through the superior vena cava, while the inferior vena cava is free of the bubbles. And so this uh, echo free space in the, uh, or contrast free space in the right atrium represents blood streaming from the inferior vena cava. But uh, what's the size of this shunt? Can we uh, quantify it? Small shunt is considered if there is one to five bubbles, moderate six to 25, and a large is a more than 25 bubbles. However, the number of bubbles crossing the left atrium is dependent on the number of bubbles injected intravenously. But under normal circumstances and normal injections, this would be at the relative scale of the size of the shunt. So the question is, what was the likelihood that uh, she would be found to have a patent for amino valley? And this is the incidence of postnatal PFO and autopsy of normal hearts. And essentially with all ages, that is about 25 to 30 percent prevalence of patent foramen ovale in general population. Let's look at the atrial septal anatomy. What's the basis of this shunt? This is the right atrial side of atrial septum on 3D TE. Uh, and the, this is fossa ovalis. And these are the all structures, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, coronary sinus, and parts of the aortic valve. And the patent foramen ovale is located in the supero anterior portion of the fossa ovalis. You can actually see it also, and this is a, a transillumination on the 3D, the, how thin the fossa ovalis is relatively to the rest of the septum. And from the left atrial side, uh, you often don't see much other than the fossa ovalis and these uh, surrounding structure, including the right upper pulmonary vein and the coronary sinus. Um, patent foramen ovale is a persistent inter uh, atrial communication that is uh, physiologic in utero um, and cause of a patent foramen ovale is a lack of complete fusion between the septum prime, the flap, and the septum secundum, the rim. And the location is in the antero superior portion of the fossa ovalis and as I said the prevalence is about 25 percent of adult population. And this is a moving 3D image. The structures are uh, labeled and actually you can see that there is a patent foramen ovale in the supero anterior portion seen from the right atrial side. And now if I turn it around, you'll actually see the patent foramen ovale from uh, the left side. And that's the patent foramen ovale between the rim and the flap. And I can have it here in a still image to use it recognized from the right atrial side and from the left atrial side. Septum primum flap, septum primum flap, and septum secundum, which is the rim. And again, if you do it on a TE, you can also, also observe the shunt directly through the PFO. Also notice not only there is an early appearance of a bubbles, but also the bubbles uh, across the PFO occur in puffs. That is to say, there is only transient increase in the right atrial pressure over the left atrial pressure, which allows to this intermittent boluses of contrast to cross the patent foramen ovale. So PFO is characterized not only by early, but this bolus-like um, flow across the patent foramen ovale. And actually you can see from the guidelines, uh, this is from a pediatric population. Again, you can see a large amount of bubbles going across uh, the PFO in this bolus, intermittent bolus uh, fashion. And these are just the still images of different faces in this patient with a, who has a tunnel type patent foramen ovale. And how do we differentiate patent foramen ovale from intrapulmonary shunt? Um, we should not use timing of bubbles as the only differentiator between the patent foramen ovale and intrapulmonary shunt. Uh, patent foramen ovale tends to have early bubble appearance within three to six cycles and intrapulmonary shunt tends to have um, later appearance of bubble. However, we should look at the location of bubble crossing, flow pattern, shunt enhancement, and additional features. Let's look at the examples of patent foramen ovale versus intrapulmonary shunt. 47-year-olds, otherwise healthy woman, history of multiple cryptogenic strokes, MRI shows small acute infarct, 
at the left temporal parietal border. So she has injected sal saline, agitated saline at rest. And let's look at her agitated saline. And there are bubbles do not show up early, but eventually do show up. See, there's a good injection. And there is a Valsalva maneuver. So that's again, there is a delayed appearance of bubbles, but they do appear in a significant amount. So then we look at the official report from an outside hospital. And they said that after intravenous injection of agitated saline, there is a late appearance of bubbles in the left atrium. This is consistent with intrapulmonary shunt, which is um, debatable. And the degree of retinal shunting and agitated saline is small. So you might ask yourself, does this TT truly demonstrate intrapulmonary shunt? So let's look at this again. Yes, there is probably, it's about the four to five beats before the bubbles appear. But when they do appear, they appear in a bolus-like fashion, intermittent bout. There is a no uh, increase in the amount of bubbles uh, as the cardiac cycle increases. And plus, we can actually see the bubbles crossing. When they do cross, they cross at the level of a patent foramen ovale. Same occurs with the Valsalva maneuver in this patient. Again, you can actually see it directly passing at the level of interatrial septum. So timing is the only one differentiator. We have to look at whether it's across the PFO or from the pulmonary vein. What's the flow pattern? Patent foramen of alley is characterized by puffs or boluses of contrast with rapid clearing in the left heart resulting from only transient increase in the right atrial pressure of the left atrial pressure. As opposed to intrapulmonary shunt, there is a slow arrival of bubbles into the left heart with progressive increase in bubble volume over time. Also, what enhances the flow across uh, lesions? Patent foramen ovale is favored by increase in bubble crossing after Valsalva, maneuver, cough, or push on the abdominal wall as opposed to intrapulmonary shunt, which is favored by upright body position, because that's the syndrome of uh, orthodeoxia platypnea. And additional features, uh, the presence of atrial septal aneurysm strongly favors patent foramen of alley, while intrapulmonary shunt is characterized by disorders uh, associated with AD malformation, such as liver disease or hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. And again, these are the characteristic of patent foramen ovale. So therefore, if you answer this question, this patient did not have intrapulmonary shunt. She actually had patent foramen ovale despite delay appearance of bubbles. So it's an important teaching point. And just uh, for comparison, this is a bubble injection to somebody with intrapulmonary shunt. And indeed, there is a very delayed, but then after the bubbles come, there is a continuous uh, increase and uh, bubbles at a steady rate. You don't have that sense of a ball of spuff intermittent that you have in the PFO. And actually, clearly here, you can actually see the bubbles showing uh, and arriving from the pulmonary veins rather than across the intatrial septum. Again, this is somebody with the intrapulmonary shunt, very delayed appearance of a bubbles, but when they do appear, they continuously increase in amount of flow rather than a bolus like that we saw with the patent foramen of alley. Again, this is intrapulmonary shunt. You can actually see that the bubbles come from the pulmonary veins, directly um, confirming that this is an intrapulmonary shunt. We can see that also on a TE. There is appearance of delayed appearance bubbles and that they go through, in this case, left upper pulmonary vein. They can be unilateral only to the left-sided pulmonary veins or bilateral for both light, right and left or vice versa. So again, this is a summary table of differentiating patent for amino valley from intrapulmonary shunt using agitated saline injection. But there are other uh, uses for agitated saline, such as the right ventricular free wall rupture. This is somebody after bypass surgery, 
you can actually see here that there is a, a perforation of the right ventricular free wall. And then if you do agitated saline, you can actually see that there is a truly extravasation of fluid into the pericardial space through a free wall rupture. So it's a free wall rupture, saline contrast, extravasation into the pericardium. And a little bit of zoom up image, and actually can clearly see the utility of agitated saline for right-sided lesion, in this case, the perforated uh, right ventricular free wall. We can use, use agitated saline also for enhancement of right heart Doppler signals. Um, this is a continuous Doppler across the tricuspid valve at baseline before we gave contrast, and you can clearly see that the tricuspid regurgitan jet signal is uh, barely um, obtainable without the contrast, but now after agitated saline, the contra uh, contrast helps truly uh, visualize the TR jet, and now it's clearly we can say that the, the gradient is about 35 millimeters between the right ventricle and the right atrium across the tricuspid valve. And another use of agitated saline to show the persistent left superior vena cava. Again, you can clear the example. Obviously, the bubbles show up first in the dilated coronary sinus and then in the right heart. Let's watch that again as the loop back, see the uh, coronary sinus first, and then next, the right heart. So this pattern, dilated coronary sinus first, right heart. Next is a characteristic of persistent left superior vena cava. And now we can see it on the M mode, see the coronary sinus is going to be first, and then the right heart next. That's a very characteristic of persistent left superior vena cava. You can also use agitated saline to show um, uh, whether there is a baffle leak in patients with atrial switch operation who had a DTGA, uh, uh, transposition or complete transposition of great artery. So essentially you check intravenous, you see that the left, anatomic left ventricle is essentially a venous ventricle. Um, and then you actually observed uh, the appearance of bubbles on the right side anatomic right side of the heart, which is a systemic SAR. So the appearance of a bubble in the right heart would actually uh, correspond to a uh, left, uh, to a shunt into the systemic circulation across the baffle. Uh, so this is atrial switch operation, uh, and that's a morphologic left ventricle that functions as the pulmonic ventricle. And now this is another case of the patient, the same thing that there is a large amount of bubbles uh, which is equivalent essentially to a right to left uh, shunt physiologically and essentially that, that there is a baffle, in this case a mustard baffle, there is a leak which can lead to desaturation in such patient. So that's, that's another example of used of agitated saline. Mustard baffle leak, it's the physiologic, it's essentially pathologic right to left shunt. Another use of agitated saline during pericardiocentesis so pericardial synthesis, intrapericardial injection of agitated saline to assess needle position. In this case, the needle is uh, in the pericardial space, truly an agitated saline is injected and we confirm we are in the agitated saline, so it's uh, safe to withdraw blood. Um, and then indeed, this was removed, 700 cc's was removed uh, and the patient felt much better. This is uh, different. Uh, this is attempted intrapericardial injection of agitated saline to assess needle position, but you see here what happened, there is a mishap, a needle ended up in the right ventricle. Um, and actually see that the opacification of the right ventricle, which is uh, essentially the, the patient right heart was stabbed, uh, necessitating open heart surgery. So this is the bubbles in the right ventricle that they should not be. How about a microbubble contrast agent or commercial agent? Uh, what are the, their potential uses? There are five of them, of which LV opacification or endocardial border is the only on-label use. However, it could be off-label use for structural abnormalities such as thrombus, apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, non-compaction, pseudoaneurysm, or free wall rupture. They could be used for perfusion of the myocardium, intracardiac masses, or myocardium itself, uh, for Doppler signal enhancement on the left-hand side, uh, and then we can use for miscellaneous uses, as we showed for aortic dissection or for artifacts.
How about alveolar pacification? This is the primary indication for use of the commercial contrast agents. So this is the baseline transthoracic echocardiogram. Barely the left ventricle is barely visualized. More than uh, inability to see uh, two or more uh, segments is an indication for use of a contrast. You give a uh, microbubble contrast or antrostar enhancing agent, and now you can actually see that the beautifully left ventricle is opacified and the left ventricle is hyperdynamic. How about this case, 64 year old a man with hypertension, diabetes, obesity presents with exertional uh, dyspnea and he was referred for exercise stress echo. So this is his baseline image. It's a barely visible um, heart, left ventricle borders are not delineated. And if you do contrast, uh, this is part from the uh, stress echo, you actually can nicely delineate and show that the normal left ventricular function uh, and this is the full panel of this patient and clearly we can evaluate stress uh, echocardiogram properly in this patient, which we would not have been possible without the use of microbubble contrast. And uh, one of the major area of use of a microbubble contrast is stress echocardiography. And this is the apical two chamber in this patient. But it's then a long axis view and the short axis view. So conclusion, normal contrast enhanced stress echocardiogram. So teaching points, use of microbubble contrast when LV endocardial resolution is suboptimal and if you hierarchy in the stress echocardiography is from four to two to three and then parastenal short axis. If you lose parastenal long and parastenal short axis views uh, initially, they could be shadowed by the contrast in the right heart. Um, what are the uh, pitfalls of use microbubble contrast? So this is one of them, that there is a too much contrast is a given. And the attenuation, if you just wait a little bit, the contrast will dissipate and you will see a larger and larger part of the myocardium. And essentially this is now with the final, uh, the time has passed, you can actually see uh, the attenuation has gone. So if you go back to the original, again, so this is way too much contrast, but if the time passes, it will go away, and then you have to wait enough to avoid attenuation, essentially a contrast shadowing itself. And this is a too much contrast, wait until contrast washes away to start imaging. Pitfall, another is a contrast destruction with high mechanical index. You can actually see that the mechanical index um, destroys bubbles at the LV apex, uh, it's a very high mechanical index, 1.7, um, and it clearly should be much lower. How about using contrast for thrombus, LV apical thrombus? Um, this is uh, somebody with the myocardial infarction in the apical segment, and there is a clearly, a, um, in this case, it's easy to recognize there is a thrombus um, in the apex. However, sometimes uh, like the cystic lesions and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, and then after myocardial infarction. Then you can clearly see that there is a um, mass in the apex, an akinetic apex does not take up the contrast, which would be characteristic of avascular structure such as a thrombus. And uh, the ASC guidelines of cardiac source emboli from 2015, we discussed um, this topic and this is illustration from uh, that publication shows the uh, thrombus in the LV apex panel A without contrast and a B post contrast, beautiful opacification of the left ventricle and no opacification of thrombus, which is characteristic um, of thrombi since they are avascular and they do not take up the contrast. So these are the legends for the appropriate uh, figures and this is the issue of that journal, which one of the panel B is used uh, for the cover page of that issue. So what are the guidelines, ASD guidelines? This is the uh, that LV thrombus that I showed you without the contrast and then with the contrast. And this is exactly how the contrast should be evaluated, um, should be used to evaluate the LV apical thrombus, lack of us opacification is characteristic of thrombus because it's an avascular structure. How about tumors, LV lymphoma? Uh, 
41 year old woman, HIV associated Burkitt lymphoma. And actually, you can see there is a lymphoma intra uh, left ventricle um, with, that takes up the contrast. That will be a more character. And see also that the normal uh, left ventricular wall motion that decreases the chance of a clot formation. Clot formation is associated with abnormal wall motion. In this case, we have a normal wall motion mass that it uh, takes up the contrast uh, indicative of uh, some degree of vascularization. So again, comparison between the thrombus with the LAD infarct uh, and a tumor. On the left, no opacification. On the right, opacification. Thrombus versus tumor. How about use for another tumor, for left atrial myxoma? So non-contrast. This is a typical location of a uh, myxoma in the left atrium attached to the uh, interatrial septum at the level of fossa ovalis. And then we can do injection and there is a partial uptake, partial lack of uptake. So this is heterogeneous pattern of opacification by macronbubble contrast is relatively characteristic for myxoma. How about use for contrast for apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? 57-year-old uh, woman, asymptomatic, ab abnormal pre-employment EKG, hypertension, and her nephew has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So let's look at this is her EKG with highly abnormal deep T-wave inversion in the uh, precordial leads. And this is her non-contrast uh, image, um, difficult to evaluate the apex, However, uh, we suspect that there is apical variant of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and we expect a spade uh, sign in the apex, which is much easier to observe after uh, intravenous injection of ultrasound enhancing agents. Now, this is really a microbubble ultrasound enhancement agent demonstrate that the spade-like shape of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In some patients with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that involves the mid and apical segment can end up with the apical akinetic chamber. Um, and that's the best uh, demonstrated echocardiographically using microbubble contrast. See that there is a, a hypertrophy of the apex and the uh, mid portion of the ventricle, extending toward the mid portion of the ventricle. Um, and then uh, in this patient, you actually see that there is a hypertrophy hypertrophy of the uh, relatively mid portion of the ventricle creating the apical akinetic chamber, uh, which is best visualized by microbubble contrast agents. And actually this is the comparative MRI image that again shows the akinetic apical chamber. How about non-compaction? Um, again, this is another condition in which uh, microbubble uh, contrast or ultrasound enhancement agents can help. This is use of definity contrast in a short axis view and a patient with extensive trabeculations inside the left ventricle characteristic of a non-compaction. This is a short axis view. Sometimes it's easier to show them in the long axis view. So this is a microbubble contrast is somebody with extensive trabeculation involving the entire LV apex toward the mid ventricle characteristic of non-compaction apical four chamber view. Um, and sometimes instead of a contrast, you can use uh, a low velocity uh, Doppler, color Doppler to show interstices uh, between these trabeculations. But demonstration of trabeculations themselves is best accomplished by a microbubble contrast. And how about enhancement of Doppler signals on the left hand side? That's another use of a contrast agents. Um, here is an example of um, aortic stenosis evaluation. So this is maximum velocity before contrast agent enhancement. It's a 3.3 meters per second. Um, and this would suggest that there is a moderate aortic stenosis. However, if you give uh, microbubble contrast and give it appropriately, here you can actually see that the velocity is increases to 4.1 meters, establishing the diagnosis of severe aortic stenosis. However, one has to be very judicious in using this uh, contrast in aortic stenosis to avoid measuring the blooming artifact and mistaking it for true uh, Doppler signal. So this is um, 
if you use correctly, you will enhance the spectral Doppler tracings, just as you can use agitated saline to enhance tricuspid regurgitin jet. But here these are examples of a blooming artifact as opposed to correct use of contrast in the same patient. So uh, blooming artifact, so the too much contrast as opposed to correct, no spectral broadening, and then we can really trust this tracing to represent uh, true velocities rather than on the top that is indistinct border between the true signal and the blooming artifact. And finally, uh, there's another form of contrast that we see in echocardiography, and that's spontaneous echo contrast. This is we don't inject anything into the patient, and yet uh, uh, bubbles appear inside the heart that emulate uh, contrast agents such as agitated saline or even microbubble contrast. So, what are the contrast agents? Again, we discussed agitated saline, we discussed microbubble contrast, and now let's look at the spontaneous echo contrast. So. This is one example of a spontaneous echo contrast inside the left ventricle. You see that it's an intermittent appearance of a large uh, bubbles, or relatively large bubbles inside the left ventricle. You also notice that the patient has a mechanical mitral prosthesis. And what do we see here? So essentially that's an example of a spontaneous contrast in the patients with the mechanical valve, in this case, mitral mechanical valve. So the leaflets have a very violent motion um, with each opening and closing. And this violent motion creates pockets of vacuum and then uh, CO2 that is normally dissolved inside the blood bubbles out into those pockets of vacuum. Sort of equivalent when you open a, a soda bottle or a soda can, the bubbles will uh, come out. Those are CO2 bubbles, so the same thing is here, except that the vacuum is created by the movement of mechanical prosthesis. And that creates a spontaneous echo contrast. So this is a common phenomenon observed with mechanical uh, prosthetic valves. And how about this? This is another form of spontaneous echo contrast. This is a transesophageal echocardiogram uh, of a left atrial appendage with somebody with atrial fibrillation, uh, rapidly fibrillating left atrial appendage, and a spontaneous echo contrast creation um, due to blood stasis. This is a red blood so cell create a rouleau formation that we then call spontaneous echo contrast or colloquially smoke. And uh, if the smoke is more dense, we refer to that as sludge. So now what's the safety of microbubble uh, echo contrast, the commercially available contrast? Uh, this is in October, 2007, there was a microbubble uh, package insert. And um, at that time, um, the contraindications were to use, uh, uh, not to use it where there was a established right to the left shunt, or there is a hypersensitivity to agent. And also there was a concern about serious cardiopulmonary reactions, anaphylactoid reactions, and systemic embolization of Definity. And that led to a, a black box warning about serious cardiopulmonary reaction um, in 2007, uh, saying that the, uh, the contrast should be uh, given with caution. However, in 2014, a cardiac, um, in the guidelines uh, on the use of contrast agents to, for card by cardiac sonographers from 2014, it was shown that actually uh, agents are safe. One of the largest retrospective cohort examined 1,900 patients with pulmonary hypertension. Um, and after completion of pulmonary hemodynamic studies, there was shown no significant untoward effects and therefore further revision of the black box warning occurred in 2011, including removal of statements requiring monitoring of the pulmonary hypertension. And this is uh, in 2017, uh, there was uh, still the systemic embolization and the contraindication for somebody with established right to left shunt was uh, still cited in the package insert as a contraindication. So this was early 2000. 17. However, FDA removed contraindication for the use uh, of these microbubble contrast agents in patients with the right to left or bidirectional shunt. So 
we can conclude that echo micro bubble contrast safety record is good. There was a stress echo studies with over 40,000 patients and the safety and efficacy of contrast for stress echo was retrospectively analyzed in three medical centers and the risk of both uh, non-fatal myocardial infarction and death was very low and no different than uh, in matched cohort of about 19,000 patients who want stress echocardiography without uh, the contrast. And there was another study of hospitalized patients, even larger, almost 60,000 patients. And there was a retrospective analysis um, of patients with and without contrast agent use. Uh, and again, there was uh, no significant uh, signal that definitely uh, was detrimental. If anything else, there was a 24% less likely to die within one day than those not receiving contrast. So what are the current concerns? for the contrast agent. So there is only hypersensitivity, which is anaphylactory reaction or intraarterial injection is still listed uh, as a contraindication. However, we still routinely use it intraarterially in for uh, alcohol septal ablation. So it's, here it's important to emphasize that uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension is not a contraindication and the right to left or bidirectional shunt are no longer contraindication for the use of microbubble contrast agents or ultrasound enhancing agents. Going back to intraarterial injection by the uh, package insert, this should not be done and it's a contraindication, yet it has been safely used during alcohol septal ablation. And I'll show you just a quick example of echo and alcohol septal ablation, percutaneous alternative to surgical septal myectomy in patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is where the alcohol septal ablation is done. So this is the inventor of alcohol septal uh, ablation, Ulrich Siegward, German cardiologist. And this is his original paper on uh, that procedure. And uh, Sheriff Nage was an early uh, evaluator of the role of contrast echocardiography during alcohol septal ablation. This is uh, back in 1998. And they showed that the uh, percutaneous alternative to surgical septal myectomy using contrast is um, uh, relatively safe. And this is one such patient that is a clearly septal mitral contact with the hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, systolic anterior motion, um, and uh, after patient failed medical therapy, they are referred for alcohol septal ablation. This is the patient uh, tracing even at the rest. He has a gradient of about three meters and post PVC, the gradient rises to all uh, to uh, six meters. And this is a clearly an example of rock and roll uh, phenomenon, post PVC enhancement of a gradient across um, LVOT. Uh, and this is Brock and Rowe himself. And this is his original paper from 1961 and the original tracings showing PVC and post PVC enhancement. Mm -hmm. This is an angiogram an alcohol septal ablation. You inject the left uh, coronary artery and identify uh, the origin of a septal uh, branch. In this case, this is the first septal branch that it's visualized. And after that, echo contrast is injected is into the septal branch intraarterially and then we then observe the pattern of pacification in the myocardium uh, ideally they should uh, this contrast should be limited only to interventricular septum the proximal portion supplied by the septal branch um, and we do not want uh, situations in which the septal branch might be supplying a moderator band or even the right ventricular free wall. In that case, myocardial infarction can actually extend into the right ventricle or other structures uh, supplied by the septal branch. So uh, a contrast, echo, uh, echo uh, ideally this echo contrast should be confined to the proximal uh, septum as this is the case. And then after that, the balloon um, is placed inside the left uh, inside the septal branch. And then after balloon inflation, uh, alcohol injected into the distal portion of that. And we can actually observe echocardiographically. And this is now alcohol injection into the septum. And alcohol often lights up the myocardium 
uh, more strongly than the echo contrast itself, but this is only after we have established that the septal branch is confined only to the proximal septum. And after that, uh, the patient uh, microbubble contrast uh, was injected and his situation, his gradient improved. So let's conclude that the microbubble echo contrast agents have good overall safety profiles. Uh, and I hope you enjoy it and thank you very much.